tonight we're talking uh, again to the ventilator matters team and we're going to uh, have a presentation from Ross Freeburn, uh, article that he published in Critical Care titled, What Do Mean Airway Pressures Mean? And it's a topic that I, uh, I've been looking forward to for a long time. This is a uh, picture of the Bella Vista, but I'd really rather people discussed rather than me lectured in this. But I wanted to start by talking about the article. I talked about the fact that in the 1990s, um, well, certainly when I trained, um, in the late 80s, and that we didn't know which pressures um, to measure. Um, and I remember sitting in front of a ventilator and wondering about, knowing not very little about it, what pressure I should be looking at. And probably with the peak airway pressure, which is easy to see, or some of these other numbers that came up. Um, I was talking to Keith Hickling some time after that, and he was telling me about the... Uh, the conference in 1993 at Northbrook in Illinois where they argued apparently for a whole session about what pressure they should be measuring and they finally came to the conclusion that perhaps incorrectly that the plateau pressure was the determining pressure of alveolar distension um, and I say incorrectly because I, I believe it's the trans alveolar pressure that is, is the true pressure we should be measuring um, but they settled on the the plateau pressure, and that's defined our ventilation strategies for the last 20 odd years, um, including the ARSNET paper and Amato's paper, something we all dealt with a, the idea that the plateau pressure um, is the, here is the pressure that uh, is, is important. So um, the peak pressure here during the flow, the flow cycle of a volume and the plateau pressure here is the pressure that we should be looking at. And we've sort of ended up, this is the equation of life, it's you know, Rohr's equation or the equation of motion, but really the equation of life for ventilation and the, the pressure we're measuring at any time, not just at peak time, but at any time is the flow at that time. Oops. Times the resistance uh, plus the volume divided by the compliance at that point plus the peak. And these are very dynamic things because the volume and compliance change um, in relation to each other with a real lung. On an artificial lung, of course, the compliance tends to be constant and the resistance is constant. But in the real world, as the lung expands, the compliance changes and the resistance changes as the airways expand and decrease in size. And I think it's important. The pressure we're often interested in, the, the plateau pressure, is the pressure in the alveolus, which is the volume of the compliance plus peep. And of course, we decided that we would measure that. And there are two alveolar pressures that we can measure. One is what we use to define the dynamic compliance, which is immediately after the end of inspiration, um, where there is still some pendle of gas movement between the alveolar sacs. And but a short time after that, when gas flow is arrested completely, which we usually measure during a, a, a formal inspiratory pause, um, the pressure often drops slightly, and that's the static uh, compliance that we're measuring there. But that's the, it's the alveolar pressure that I think is important because that's the pressure that is seen by the alveolus. And if we think that damage is being done by over distension or stress or strain on the alveolus, it is that pressure that's doing it, not the pressure in the in the outer airway. And uh, I'm going to talk. Uh, of course, uh, some modes, of course, rely on raised mean airway pressure as the way they deliver it. And I think, in particular, APRV, which I don't use personally, but many people do, really relies on the fact that the airway pressure is elevated throughout the cycle, apart from the short expiratory phase or in P low phase, and this is the way oxygenation um, is enhanced using APRV. Similarly, with os um, high frequency oscillation, there was a lot of work, and I think Steve, you were involved in this, um, with uh, uh, the measurement of mean airway pressure, or the as a measure of uh, the uh, the oxygenation parameters was with oscillatory um, systems using the mean airway pressure as an oxidation determinant. Um, so I want to talk about something we have been talking about in the last few minutes, just about the way 
where you can use mean wave pressure um, to improve oxygenation. And the way I was taught is there are only two ways to raise oxygenation. Um, generally, they are to raise the partial pressure of the inspired gas, which generally means turning up the FI2, although barometric, uh, using a barometric crane chamber has been suggested, but not particularly useful. And the second way is to raise the mean airway pressure. And I've got some slides here showing that on the left is uh, the pressure waveform for a volume cycle with the peak and switch pressure and then the plateau pressure. And if we were to increase the tidal volume, or if it was the pressure control mode to increase the driving pressure, we increase the uh, the um, the size of the breath, and therefore increase the mean airway pressure. And not this does this by two means. I, I believe the mean airway pressure rise in the alveolus does increase the oxygen exchange into the alveolus of the normal alveolus, so that there is a real oxygenation change because of the raised mean alveolar pressure directly. But there's also the fact that by increasing the tidal volume or increasing the driving pressure, we increase the minute ventilation and this decreases arterial CO2 and that decreases alveolar CO2 and therefore increases the alveolar oxygen available to move across the membrane because of the alveolar gas equation tells us there's more oxygen actually available. So that on its own may have an effect. The second way we can raise mean airway pressure is by increasing, changing the profile of the, of the inspiratory cycle. And with volume modes, there's two options. One is to increase the total inspiratory time by slowing the inspiratory flow rate, or increasing the pause time. On pressure control, it's simply a matter of increasing the inspiratory time. And both of these have the effect. And they have an effect, again, I believe, because it raises the mean airway pressure and has a high, High, higher driving pressure across the alveolar membrane. Um, and, but also because the lung is not just a set of balloons, um, it's, a, it's a 300 million balloons, it increases the redistribution of, to the, of gas to the alveolar sacs with long time constants and allows them to be involved in ventilation, features of the shunt fraction. Um, so those with higher resistances and higher compliances are therefore more likely to be involved in normal gas exchange if there's a long respiratory time. So that's the second way we can do it. And the third way we can raise the mean airway pressure is by increasing PEEP, which is the one that every nurse in my ICU knows how to do. And they're always turning the PEEP up to improve oxygenation. And this again has a direct effect, I think, by raising the mean airway pressure and improving oxygenation. But of course, it reopens or prevents the tidal collapse of the alveoli and therefore decreases shunt fraction. There's a th another mechanism that has been suggested by which um, mean airway pressure and, and particularly peak may improve oxygenation, which is a little concerning, um, is that the, by raising the interthoracic pressure, we raise the pressure in the pulmonary capillaries and therefore increase the resistance it may affect the rate of flow of blood across the alveolus. By doing that, we, we reduce the VQ mismatch and therefore improve the oxygen content. At the same time, we may subtly decrease the cardiac output. And therefore, although the oxygen in each mill of blood is increased, the number of mills of blood being delivered to the tissue is also likely to be decreased. And the balance of those two things may change the delivery of oxygen. So although a bit, bit of saturation monitor looks really good, but the oxygen delivery of the tissues may be decreased. And, and that is certainly an effect in some situations, particularly dehydrated patients, um, if, and if we're using high pressures. We certainly know that we can overpeep people, and we overpeep them. We tend to think of that about over the stitch of the alveoli, but we may also be decreasing cardiac output significantly. So we've talked and we interchange two terms quite frequently, I certainly do, um, the mean airway pressure and the mean alveolar pressure. We tend to think they mean the same thing. And over the last two or three weeks, I've been thinking very hard about what does that mean? Um, and how do they differ? Um, 
And uh, the formula that was given by in John Marini's paper suggested that the mean alveolar pressure is equal to the median wave pressure plus the minute ventilation divided by 60 times the difference between respiratory and inspiratory resistances. I've reworked that because I believe it's important to think about it that the average pressure in the alveolus is equal to the airway, average airway pressure plus the summation of the flow times resistance during expiration minus the flow times resistance during inspiration because those resistances and pressures may change significantly over uh, over the course of it and they are significantly different. The, the inspiratory and expiratory resistances change and are different at different flow. Then I started to think about this and my head started to hurt a lot because um, the, if you look at with, uh, the Marini's paper the, that he did on this some time ago um, and uh, another, a couple of other papers that during inspiratory flow the pressure in the airway is going to be greater than the, than, um, the pressure in the alveolus and that's obvious because there's an inward flow of gas, therefore the pressure outside must be greater than the pressure inside. Um, during inspiratory pause, assuming this is a, a prolonged pause, the pressure in the airway is equal to the pressure in the alveolus, but this may not always happen during a pause period, but would happen during a prolonged inspiratory pause. And during expiration, the pressure in the uh, outer airway is less than the pressure in the alveolus. So, as flow equals volume at a time and flow times time equals volume, then it's assuming the same volume goes in as it goes out, then the flow times time on inspiration equals the flow times time on expiration. And a longer inspiration gives lower flows for the same volume. So you end up with the same equation. Thus, the only difference in our problem is really that of resistance, that the flow times time will be the same um, on inspiration as expiration. Now, that's not entirely true, but, but that's close enough to the truth for me. Um, and there's, the only difference then is the resistance. Uh, this is the paper by Kenyon and EC, um, which they looked um, at the um, pressures on inspiration and expiration and looked at the relation, relationship and modeled it. And they came up with the, the equation I just showed you before that the pressure on inspiration is likely, airway pressure will be higher on inspiration and lower on expiration. And they came to the conclusion that the alveolar pressure was probably, was almost always higher on, on uh, than the airway pressure, the mean airway pressure. But they, when I was reading the paper, they said, for simplicity, we assume that airway resistance does not change with, with lung volume. And I was quite astounded by the fear this assumption because it is clearly incorrect. Um, this is a, the resistance um, to flow changes with lung volume and, and we know that as the lung expands the resistance gets lower as the airways expand in size and as the lung collapses on expiration the resistance significantly increases and this is one of the problems we have with uh, chronic airways disease particularly in asthma but it happens in normal circumstances as well. Um, and we, we also know that, that this is uh, again from the Bella Vista looking at a inspiratory and expiratory compliance curve and showing there is a hysteresis between the, um, the flow, sorry, the pressure and volume relationship on inspiration and expiration. So therefore the resistance, the volume on expiration is higher than on inspiration. And therefore if the volume is higher, the resistance may be also altered. The shape of that, those, that curve alters the change in resistance. So we've got a double problem now. And this is where my head really did start to hurt because I started to think I really don't, I'm not going to understand that. And then I realized I wouldn't understand it because not only that, most of the resistance is in the outer airway yes. and not in the inner airway. And then because I was trying to think of a part one question for the exam, I started thinking about laminar flow and that hurt my head a lot. Um, and of course, the assumption with all the calculations that I started doing was that there was to some degree laminar flow. And the laminar flow is, is dependent, of course, upon a number of things. 
um, there being a, a, a reasonable enough um, caliber um, and the flow is, uh, is direct and not um, interfered by other things, which of course the airway is highly unlikely to occur. Um, and it's determined by Reynolds number, which if you look at the, the because it's a, it's a uh, it's a gas, it's not so bad, but there is a lot of turbulence, particularly as the gas accelerates. So turbulent flow, which affects this resistance um, greatly, is dominant in the upper airway where the velocity is high. Um, in the early generation airways due to the regular branching and changes in diameter and the sharp angles, um, and, but it reduces as the gas gets down to the lower bronchioles. Now, I, I think this is of particular importance, and just to diverge a little bit, this is important with the argument about stress and strain, is that by the time the gas is, gets down to the lower airways, it's traveling very slowly and in a laminar fashion, and there's not much loss of energy due to resistance. And the resistance, we, the drop in pressure we see on inspiration is in the upper airways. We don't get ARDS of the outer airways as in the alveolus. So I'm not sure that including the equation of motion, the photon resistance part is, um, is actually relevant to, to uh, deciding the strain and stress that's seen by the alveolus. But that's a slightly different argument. Um, the, what happens, of course, is as the gas goes faster, the, there's more turbulent flow, and the resistance to that flow increases um, disproportionately, in fact, out uh, of uh, proportion to the gas flow because of the acceleration of gas. And therefore, we end up with a, a problem of increasing resistance as the flow go higher. Now, I just want to th think then about what that meant to the in a, in a, in outer airways. Um, and this little graph off the Bella Vista is quite useful because it shows during the inspiratory flow time, with the, and this has been set up as a constant flow on a volume mode, the pressure would also be larger in the outer airway and there'll be a, a the pressure in the alveolus would be rising during this time to the time to the end of inspiration where the two pressures will be equal. Then the end of the of inspiratory cycle when expiration starts, there is flow outwards. And um, the pressure in the alveolus would be higher than the outer airway, but it would decelerate at a um, known decay rate, um, assuming the resistance remains unchanged. But it's in this area here, I think we get into trouble because the airway collapses, the driving pressure is falling all the time as the pressure drops in the alveolus, and also um, the airway resistance is increasing as the airways get smaller and smaller. And that did my head completely looking at the mechanics. I just gave up and went home. Um, I didn't want to think this drive it anymore. So, in summary, what I found was the, the mean wave pressure is less than the mean alveolar pressure. Uh, the variation is changeable, and the things that could change those are the relationship between the mean wave pressure and the mean alveolar pressure are the IE ratio and the flow rates. And by association, an increasing respiratory rate would change that relationship. Um, and in particular, collapsing lung and gas tripping. All the things that we have in patients with ARDS. Now, that's about why I can't measure it. And I was going to talk just briefly at the end about what data there is about the mean wave pressure and harm. Um, so this is a paper from some time ago, 99, by um, John Marini's group. And they looked at these uh, um, a rabbit, a rabbit model, and they damaged it by um, ventilating with, uh, and looking at weight gain, uh, histological scores of hemorrhage, and increases in, in uh, potassium, I think. Um, and they used large and small tidal volumes, where you can see over here, there wasn't much change, but when they used high mean airway pressures and low mean airway pressures, there was a large histological score and a large change in the weight gain of those models. So they're suggesting that the mean airway pressure may be as, as important as the tidal volume in causing harm. 
um, early this year, this is a paper from a, a Peruvian group, and they looked at ventilated patients um, with ARDS in all the Peruvian and Colombian ICUs and demonstrated that there was, uh, this is the plateau pressure, which is what we traditionally measured. This is the driving pressure, which was what Amata was suggesting we measured. And this is the mean airway pressure here that they were measuring. And they showed the correlation with cumulative um, morbidity mortality was, was about the same. There was no real difference. And their paper demonstrated that you could use if you're going to use driving pressure, you might as well use the mean pressure to demonstrate um, harm or benefit. Um, and the odds of death over 90 days in the same group, this is the PF ratios in different groups, was kind of linear, um, related in a fairly linear fashion to the mean airway pressure, suggesting there's an association between the mean airway pressure and, um, and mortality. So the higher the mean airway pressure, the more chances there were of dying which of course corresponds to compliance, which is, which is what we generally think of as being the damage done by ARDS. So, in summary, mean airway pressure is associated with some studies with outcome in ARDS. Um, higher mean airway pressure has increased mortality, and that's that paper. It generally reflects mean alveolar pressure, but the relationship's altered by the manipulation of the IE ratios, the mean flow rates, the pause time, and differential uh, lung volumes, i.e. the hysteresis and PEEP, may alter the mean wave pressure to the mean alveolar relationship as well. So the one thing I meant to say is that the one thing in the, uh, in the editorial I, I said was that if they're about the same, the good thing about mean wave pressures is it's being measured all the time. You don't have to do any, any uh, to measure the driving pressure, you have to do an inspiratory hold. To measure the plateau pressure, you have to do an inspiratory hold. I mean, mean airway pressure, you just have to look at a, um, a, a button on the, a, a um, display on the, uh, on the ventilator. So it's easy to do. Anybody can do it. Yeah, good presentation, of course. Um, you, you, you briefly covered the inspiratory time constant. Would that be something we yeah. should be measuring to get that right? Yeah, well, uh, it's, I, I've, this is where my head starts hurting. And, um, Sorry, Ross, I'm please, <laughs> No, no, um, the, the time constant, of course, is an average of all the alveoli. And I think that's the problem that with setting PEEP, setting any of these parameters, we don't have a, the perfect <coughs> alveolus. And the time constants that we measure are an average of a number of time constants, you know, of all the time constants. and in some lungs, there may be a number of very short time constants, a number of very long ones, and others, they may be generally all biased in one direction. And I think this is where the difference with recruitability and other parameters are looking at the lungs, that there are different lung problems. And I think, just to go back to COVID, not that this is particularly about COVID, that's what they found, that there were some patients who had a typical ARDS picture with poor compliance and collapse in, the, in their bases and heavy heavy lungs, and others who had relatively normal compliance, and they are, they respond differently and don't respond to recruitment. And the same, I think we find the same with time constants as well. That some patients seem to have normal compliance and normal time constants. Yeah. Ross, it's uh, really interesting stuff, and you've obviously uh, thought a lot about it, but. In terms of where we might make great leaps forward in changing outcomes for patients, I'm still thinking that we need sort of local measures of lung injury rather than global ones. And mean alveolar pressure and mean airway pressure and all the other bits and pieces we have are all sort of, if you like, um, they're, they're, they're global. And I wonder if the if the future really is to start is to is to somehow rather have other metrics which can measure regional lung strain, or tell us where there's increased risk of regional lung strain, and that might be a better uh, index of badness. You get my drift. Yeah, I I agree. I, if we could work out 
how, how to even within segments of lungs rather than individual alveoli would be really useful to, to know that. It's hard to know how with a using a mechanical model how we can do that. Bioimpedance might give us some some other information, but it's really hard to work out. You only get one number at any time. You've only got one flow, one pressure, one volume. So it's really hard to work that out. Um, yeah, and it, it comes down to a discussion, I think, in one of our earlier meetings that we had about the um, the impact of spontaneous breathing and um, and the unmeasured influence of diaphragm and the um, the unequal distribution of the strain by induced by the diaphragm's action on a diseased lung throughout the lung. Um, uh, and I, I think perhaps, you know, as you say, EIT and other sort of um, sort of non-invasive um, imaging that can give us some insight into what's happening regionally might be really useful. But uh, probably because we're not going to have that available, at least in my lifetime, um, and for many patients, maybe we just need to have better metrics that can predict that risk of um, quiet or un un undetected regional lung strain. And maybe that's where our, our research should be uh, focused. Um, I'm sort of waffling on a bit here, but maybe there needs to be an index of how much the diaphragm, how much diaphragm energy is placed, how much of the energy is driven by the diaphragm, how much is driven by the ventilator, and um, and some metric of the degree of recruitment, recruitability, and all these, throw all these things together and you end up with a slightly, a model that starts to incorporate risk of lung injury, which is based on regional problems rather than uh, global metrics. Yeah, Jeff, I, I, I agree. And I think there are, some, there are some other things we could look at, um, which I don't know how helpful they're gonna be, but things like, the CO2 trace, um, the carbon dioxide trace, which we've always assumed, you know, like it's bad because there's a big gap. There's a big gap in the CO2 trace. But if you look at the shape of the CO2 trace as it goes up, as the alveolar empties, that tells us something about what's happening in the lungs. If we could integrate all that information, we may be able to get an understanding of what is happening when some of the alveolar are closing rather than when they're all closing. And we can get more information about them, the way the pressure waveform changes yeah. in its rate of year. that may give us a bit but we just it just every time i do it i get to a point of my understanding and my head hurts and starts hurting <laughs> and then i get distracted and that's the end of it i have to go back and start again so um no I, well it's, you've, uh, you've done very well ross i i think you presented that excellently and um i could even understand it so there we are <laughs> um actually on the end of co2 it's a topic for another discussion I tried on a helmet the other day and had the entire CO2 monitor um, in the bit literally between my teeth. And what bothered me a bit is that I, my entire CO2 didn't have a nice sort of um, flat plateau. It kept on going up and up and up. I thought, well, well to my knowledge, I'm, I don't smoke. In fact, I've never smoked. And to my knowledge, I don't have COPD or asthma. Then it occurred to me that maybe the reason for that was that I was on 10 a peak. And in fact, when you are actually at, at peak, which is not optimal, yeah. Your, your, no, your regional distribution of gas within your lung isn't optimal and that you might expect BQ mismatch and differential CO2, you know, emptying from the lung. Um, I was just trying to put all that together. So yes, it's intriguing that we, we have ignored the entire CO2 for years and years and years, but there's actually pr quite a lot that could be useful if we, if we thought about it more carefully. And yeah, it's, um, it's not think about it. it it's not useful for telling you what your arterial CO2 is um, mm. in ICU. It's, it's mm. about the most useless way of telling that. Um, but it may be useful, the pattern may be useful to tell us what's happening as patients mm. breathe out. Um, yeah, we, had, uh, we have uh, some new monitors who are made by a firm that um, I wouldn't have endorsed, but they, um, they managed to give us now deliver us a end tidal CO2 that is higher than the arterial CO2. Um, <laughs> so it's a little concerning and we've been trying to get them to fix it, but um, I think you yeah, should adjust the game. Us. Me, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's just a calibration. Yeah. 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 There's actually a, an article on that. Global warming. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, you say, Jeff, you'll see. 
you, you know, you don't have COPD, but you did live in Christchurch. You've lived in Christchurch for many years, but they're small and, uh, and um, <laughs> bad air. So. No, I'm just thinking there was an article years ago that um, showed that you can get a negative um, gradient of being entitled to arterial CO2. I never understood it, but um, there you have it. I'm sure someone has written a no pine on this one if anyone wants to go and look it up. <laughs> well, I will. I will. I thought I couldn't see the way we could do it. Apart from a, a minute in time when, when things change, I couldn't see mm. how. The, because what you're saying is that the lungs are producing more CO2 than they're in the bloodstream, which means you must have a fire in your, in your alveoli somewhere. Yeah, it, it was one of those things I never understood, and I just filed it in the back of those <laughs> in the bin that said things that I don't understand. On uh, uh, mean airway pressure, uh, you had mentioned uh, the methods of affecting it in volume ventilation, then you also met mentioned the uh, impacts of or the controls in uh, pressure based breaths. Uh, two controls that are also um, available to adjust mean airway pressure are the rise time, of course, and how you manage your essence in spontaneous breathing. And sometimes I've been up against the wall uh, and those were the only things I could play with to contour the breath to adjust the mean airway pressure in, in search of a little bit higher oxygenation. This has, this has a lot of relevance to setting a peak too, which is why I ended up being interested in it because Anything that can tell you about the end of expiration and what's happening, maybe I'll, you may use that to titrate peak up and down. Um, and I know there was some work some time ago by Gommers and others looking at uh, FRC and using CO2. They couldn't get it to work. They could show, a re I, as I understand, they could get, show a relative change. They couldn't show the absolute peak that you could set. They could show it went up and down, but they couldn't show what was the best number. Um, can I make a couple of comments? Uh, Ross, uh, that was an excellent uh, discussion. And uh, right before this, I read your editorial on critical care medicine, and that really educated me as well, uh, especially about uh, the different phenotypes uh, of patients and how that might uh, influence mean airway pressure. I, I know that, uh, you know, Steve and I worked together as long ago as, what, 28 or 30 years ago when we were uh, before the low tidal volume era, but we're using pressure control ventilation and pressure control inverse ratio ventilation. And all of those years in the past, I've, I've, it's sort of been implicit to me that uh, one way you can improve oxygenation is to increase mean airway pressure, at least mean airway pressure as indicated on the ventilator. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's revelatory that that probably also corresponds with uh, reduced survival once you get above some particular level. Uh, and anecdotally, and so, you know, I have made an effort uh, when possible, not only to reduce tidal volume perhaps, but also to pay attention to mean airway pressures. Uh, uh, because the ventilators we've had for the last 20 years or so have been very good about uh, at least giving us some example of that. Um, so a, an anecdote of interest today is that I came back on service after being off about four days. Uh, there's a patient I put on ECMO with COVID-19 about five, six days ago, and then left to my uh, uh, partners and came back today and found that uh, the patient was on uh, APRB. Uh, paralyzed, sedated and paralyzed, so there's no spontaneous breathing. Uh, the P high was 34 centimeters of water and P low was zero. And, you know, the, uh, I don't know what the time was at the top, but uh, looking at the beam, airway pressure was about 28. And so that, you know, in, with, with that long of a, you know, a sustained rise, that's probably close to the mean alveolar pressure. And uh, so I was, uh, unhappy with that. And so I, I switched him back to an APD CMB. It was a Hamilton ventilator and low, lower tidal volume, a peep of 10. And we got his mean airway pressure immediately down to below 20, down in the teens. Um, and arterial blood gases didn't show any difference in oxygenation because he's on DV ECMO. Uh, 
<laughs> we're supporting him. And so, um, again, uh, I, I lamented the fact that for four or five days, my partner may have been sort of over distending and uh, possibly harming this patient uh, uh, based on the, what was really the mean alveolar pressure, not, you know, the tidal volumes were not excessive uh, when you look at the drop from the 34 to zero, but uh, I think that uh, is something that uh, I've taken into account. Really appreciate your, your uh, uh, discussion here. Well, the thing APRV is the one of the areas where, you know, it's, it's the hidden peak or the hidden mean airway pressure. We don't see that there's concerning, but um, it's really, it's tricky peak. You know, it's it's not not the P low that is, it's the fact that the machine doesn't allow the, the patient to um, to drop their airway pressure anywhere near the, the P low that we see. The Dragon machine, um, it does that particularly um, because it, when the flow falls to 75% or 25% of the machine instantly goes out to P high, um, which I found very frustrating with, with my limited use of APRV or uh, with a BiPAP with, with their system. I found it very frustrating trying to mm -hmm. set the machine. So, uh, this is the um, auto release Ross, is it? Yeah, auto release, yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's like, as I understand it, you have P high and P low, um, but the machine doesn't wait um, a time to go back to P high. It simply waits till the flow falls to 75%. Yeah. Um, and then it, it suddenly goes back up. And um, th this was in a country that you and I are familiar with, Graham, where yeah. they have um, uh, respiratory technicians who alter the ventilator and often um, on a, on a, a mantra rather than with education, and it was it was I found it particularly frustrating. Among us, very unpopular um, for a while. Um, but you were trying to ask me to intelligence, your sure problem. No, no, I was asking them how it worked, and they I don't I think there was a language difficulty. Um, oh. they, uh, and so uh, anyway. Ross, I enjoyed very much listening to your presentation on mean airway pressure, and I learned an awful lot. And I was just thinking in Jeff Shaw's comment that uh, to get uh, better bedside metrics of the regional distributions or irregularities, um, we are playing around with some ultrasound and I just wonder whether in time to come we may be able to have a better correlation between a patient with ARDS who gets a CT scan and then at the same time we can uh, try to get better images, semi-static images of the ultrasound at the same time so that uh, once we have these metrics uh, regionally, we may be able to correlate them with what we think is happening at the alveolus. Um, would that be a kind of uh, possible pathway that we can explore? Yeah, I, I, yeah. It's just thinking back, we, we, we learned so much when we started seeing patients' chests. We used to believe that ADS was, was grand glass a passage that was throughout the, the lungs. And we did CTs and realized it wasn't, it was a regional change. And that having something we did, could dynamically look at the lungs with, such as ultrasound or bioimpedance or something would be so good to be able to work out, well, what is going on? Is it the whole lung or is it a, just a region? And that would help us. I tell you what is interesting. I, I'm always coming back to what's immediately available for bedside. And Ross, you and I are both dinosaurs. Um, I'm not a big fan of ultrasound either. I think that was just the way we were brought up in the days of, you know, anatomical landmarks and uh, bicycle clips. Um, one thing I have noticed, which I find fascinating, is this idea of pendulift. And if you observe a patient uh, breathing spontaneously with a ventilator, so they're actually in synchrony, um, what you see is you often see the front part of the chest inflate first, and then you see at the, um, at the end of a breath when there's supposed to be no more tidal volume, 
this redistribution of gas from the top of the lung down to the bottom. You see the you see this rocking of the sternum. And I was thinking, well, that's really really interesting. You can see that clinically, you know, and I just wonder if there's a way that you can apply something as obvious to my eye clinically to some science that says when you've got pendulum, you've actually now got regional a lot of regional um, strain injury that's occurring at the bases, for example, around 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 the diaphragm, and whether the um, there are some uh, inferences that one can get from just looking at the patient, or if you want to get technical, you could probably have some optical sensors that instead of um, you know putting impedance bands around people's chests, for example, it might be there might be some other more indirect and less invasive way that we can just look at the patient and see if we can infer any uh, regional uh, flow, because flow of blood gas within the lung will tell you about where the pressure differences are, because it's pressure differences that drive flow, and we can see flow as in regional differences in lung ventilation. It might be that sort of approach in the future that could be helpful. I'm, I don't know, I'm just putting it out there, because, because there's a lot of stuff that we that's right in front of our eyes that we actually don't even think about. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you again, and everybody uh, breathe easy. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you, guys. Cheers. 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 Cheers.